in this lesson we will be looking at the anatomical basis of the knee joint how the structures are oriented and how these structures will play an important part in the clinical aspects of knee joint and uh, how can you relate it with the experience that you encounter in your clinical practice so regarding the knee joint first of all it's actually a synovial joint which allows movement and uh, most of the time what we see in most textbooks is the fact that it is a hinge joint but since hinge joint will allow only planar movements it is not so but in fact this is a condylar joint which is composed of the femur tibia as well as the patella acting as the articular surfaces you would see the presence of two condyloid joints between the femur and the tibia and along with that you would see the presence of a saddle joint between the femur and the patella so in combination this will form a complex synovial joint which allows a range of movements now if i look further now in most joints we are concerned about the stability the stability is in fact given by the the presence of ligaments muscles as well as the capsule now in some mcq statements you would see uh, about uh, which portion of the structures provide uh, a better significance to stability now one thing that you should remember is the fact that the muscles play an important part in comparison to the ligaments when it comes to stability even though there are multiple number of ligaments that are present the muscles play a crucial uh, play a crucial role in maintenance of the stability of the knee joints now if you look at the muscles now if you can remember the anatomy of the knee joint anteriorly there is the quadriceps anteriorly there is the quadriceps and posteriorly there is the semi membranous as well as the bicep femoris which forms the hamstrings and in laterally you would see the presence of peroneus longus and peroneus brevis muscles the lateral component of the compartment of the leg and medially you will see the adductor muscles so all of these play an important role in maintenance of the stability primarily the best muscle if you allowed to choose if you allowed to choose is the quadriceps femoris it's a well developed which enhances stability and uh, it will also reinforce the ligaments as well clinically in orthopedics now if there's some sort of an tear or a ligamental damage if the quadricep of the individual is not completely developed it will not have poor it will not have good prognosis on the healing of the joint so therefore quadriceps are paramount when it comes to stability of the knee joint right so along with that uh, i'm just i will just relate the ligament as well as the caps the important uh, effect that is provided by the capsule right so initially before going into any of the ligaments first i will be looking at the articular capsule which is also known as the fibrous capsule the articular capsule fibrous capsule now this is a very thin capsule that you see and present usually towards the middle and the posterior prospects of the knee joint deficient anteriorly this is deficient because of the fact that most of the anterior part deficient anteriorly uh, because most of the anterior aspects are covered by the presence of the quadriceps the patella which provides stability and it is attached to multiple locations this include the tibia so we call this as tibial attachments and it 
if you look closely, the tibial attachment attaches to the intercondylar region. Intercondylar attaches to the intercondylar region, thereby it limits the bounding of the posterior cruciate ligament. So limit PCL attachment that you should know. A small point that might come in some of the MCQs, therefore I have related that. And also there are a few gaps that are present in the anterior capsule which will allow the popliteus muscle to run down within the knee joint in a posteromedial manner. So the gap is present posteromedially for the purpose of the popliteus. In addition to the tibial attachment, you would see the capsule being attached to the periphery of the meniscus. This is known as the coronal ligament. In fact, if I have to be precise about it, it is the ligamental portion that is present between tibia and the meniscus. And in addition to this, there is the short lateral ligament. Short lateral ligament. This is present as a cord, cord uh, which lies deep to the fibular collateral ligament and binds to the deep to the fibular collateral ligament and binds to the popliteus. So these are the articular, the components of the articular capsule that you come across when it comes to knee joint. Now, one thing that should, you should remember, it's very thin, it's very weak, and most of the time, it is strengthened by medial and lateral patella reticula that is extending from the multiple muscles that you encounter in the knee joint. This includes the vastus, medialis, as well as the lateralis, the sartorius, as well as the iliotibial tract. So, primarily, remember that this is a weak component, will not play an important role in the stability of the joint. Uh, in addition to these, you would see few other ligaments as well. Now, there is the If I take a, if I draw a picture, these are the meniscus. These are the meniscus. Now, this is the medial meniscus this is the lateral meniscus now if you can see the medius medial meniscus is more of a semi lunar type shape whereas the lateral meniscus you would see that it is more or less circular if you take a cross section this is these meniscus are triangular triangular and that these meniscus have a convex outer border along with the concave but a thin inner border concave inner border right now, if I look at the ligaments, initially what you would see anterior, now this is the anterior prospect, you would see the presence of the, the ligamentum patella. 
if you can remember your anatomy ligamental patella is the degenerate ligament that is formed from the tendon of the quadricep femoris the quadricep femoris gets attached to the patella and from the patella some of the uh, fibers will extend towards the tibia as well so this is the ligamental patella plays an important part in uh, maintaining the uh, femoral and the patella articular surfaces along with it when once the uh, the knee joint start to mobilize then of course there are the the medial collateral ligament which is known as the medial collateral ligament which is known as the tibial because since that it's the tibia that is present uh, medially this is the tibial collateral ligament and laterally you would see the fibula collateral ligament again what they say is that this is a degenerate tendon that is of a that is coming from the peroneus longus right now if i relate a little bit of clinical aspects to this as well now the medial ligament or the fib, uh, tibial collateral ligament can be torn or uh, will will be disrupted in violent abduction this limits abduction because of its orientation in a more medial manner however in a violent abduction of the knee joint this can be torn and uh, the fibula collateral ligament is a more stable form of a ligament that you would see and usually the knee joint is not um, capable of uh, being subjected to a, a rather a violent adduction hence it is more or less stable now if you can see uh, the tibial collateral ligament plays an important part since it covers the medial aspect of the knee joint this includes the uh, the shaft of the tibia the geniculate vessel and even the nerves as well genicular nerves now uh, when it comes to fibular collateral ligament uh, since it is uh, present more or less laterally this does not have that much of an effect on uh, providing protection to interior structures in addition to this you would see the presence of a ligament that is extending between the two menisci it is present rather in an anterior manner it is known as the transverse ligament again plays a crucial role in maintenance of the meniscus particularly during rotations transverse ligament now in addition to these there are the cruciate ligaments which are very important now the cruciate ligaments are given the name according to the position that it is found in the tibia if it is present anterior then of course the name that would be given would be anterior cruciate ligament the anterior cruciate ligament however plays a limiting role for the uh, extension of the knee joint if there is abrupt extension hyper extension there is a possibility that the anterior cruciate ligament might be disrupted this is not usually seen but again can uh, play an important part when it comes to sports injury and uh, of course uh, once this gets disrupted or uh, if there's a lesion in the ligament if there's a tear the prospects of healing it within a very short period of time is minimum and it will have uh, a a rather a bad prognosis posterior to this there is the posterior cruciate ligament there are multiple tests that uh, that are present in physiotherapy which will which are also uh, uh, employed in the orthopedic practices just to see whether the ligaments are intact and whether they are very well functioning now i am not going to look at them in this video but i will be doing a follow up uh, for the knee joint the clinical aspects completely 
uh, in, a, in another uh, video where I will uh, try to exemplify them as well. So the cruciate ligaments, the posterior cruciate ligament it has an orientation of the ligament. What it does is that posterior cruciate ligaments limits backward movement. Now, if any of the cruciate ligaments are torn or uh, disrupted, what would it show is that there is a possibility that the knee joint will show offward and increase mobilization anteroposteriorly. With this test, you can see, you will have an idea that there is a possibility of a cruciate ligament uh, damage in prior to that of a MRI study or an ultrasound scan. So these are few. Uh, so there are multiple tests that you can employ. Yes, one would be the pivot shift test. The other would be anterior danger test uh, and anterior drag test, and as well as the lashment test. So these are from few uh, tests that are available, but I'm not going to look at them uh, right now. Right, the menisci. So this. Now there will be the presence of the capsule covering this. Interior to the capsule, there is the synovium. Synovium is a living layer, living um, structure that requires nourishment and involves in the production of synovial fluid. The synovium in fact, will have holes projecting in to the uh, knee joint. These are known as ala holes. These ala holes are covered by means of um, intra patella fat pads. Not clinically important, but for the sake of completion of the anatomy, I have just said this, uh, need not worry about it. Right. Now, if you look at the meniscus, uh, prior, to going to, prior to going into the uh, details about the meniscus, I would like to bring about this uh, question that has appeared in 2019, University of Peradani. So this says, uh, relate the anatomical basis, damage to the medial meniscus is more common than the damage to the lateral meniscus. So you have to bring an explanation how this is possible. Now if you can see, the meniscus plays an important part in rotation. This is why you see a limited amount of rotation when it comes to the knee joint. However, when it the, men, the meniscus, the two, the meniscus that you see, this uh, lateral as well as the medial meniscus, permits a little bit of rotation. But once it, both of these meniscus are attached and reinforced by means of ligaments. Now, as I have said previously, stability has a sort of an inverse proportionality with movement. Once the attachments are greater, it will limit movement and therefore the stability will be high. And the, if there is more mobilization, the chances of a disruption or a clinical tear is somewhat less. But if the ligament attachments and the, 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 even though the strengthening inside, but in perspective, in, in, in circumstances where there is excessive movement, there is a possibility that the ligament might be torn apart. So, the conclusion that you can come is if there are higher attachments, motion will be limited, stability would be high, but the chances to which it can uh, be uh, subjected to a tear or a uh, lesion would be high as well. Tear risk would be high. So in this case, if you 
know your anatomy, you would see that the most of the time, if the medial meniscus, which usually undergo tears in uh, certain awkward moments. Now, if you can look at this diagram, now you would see this is the lateral meniscus, this is the medial meniscus. The medial meniscus is close to that of the tibial collateral ligament, the sartorius, which is the muscle, and the gracilis as well. Gracilis is in fact present posterior, so gracilis. So most of the time what you would see is that there are multiple tendons that are rising from the tibial collateral ligament that binds to the medial meniscus and limits its motion. It provides stability all right but once there is awkward movement or there is this abrupt, abrupt uh, rotations that uh, will cause tears in between them and most of the time the medial ligament will be subjected to tears and uh, but when in comparison to that of the lateral meniscus the lateral meniscus meniscus is provided support by the popliteus this popliteus muscle will pull the lateral meniscus in a, in a in a more of a backward manner and by doing so it will um, protect it and prevent it being crushed between the articular surfaces. So most of the time it's the medial ligament which has a propensity to be damaged in rotation. So this is what they have asked. Damage to the medial meniscus is more common than damage to lateral meniscus. So you, would, you should say that there are two meniscus that are present in the knee joint. One is, a, uh, one is the lateral whereas and the other is the medial. The medial is present in close proximity to that of the uh, the tibial collateral ligament as well as the sartorius muscles in rotation and in uh, and in addition to that you have to say that uh, the medial collateral ligament is fixed in a more stable manner to the uh, ligaments as well as the muscles so the ligaments will limit its motion but when uh, the knee is subjected to some sort of a rotation there is a higher propensity or a susceptibility for the tears to occur at this particular position rather than the lateral because the lateral is more or less protected by the popliteus which pulls it backward and prevent getting uh, damage due to awkward rotations so are we good now something that i have to say along with this is that uh, in when it comes to tears this more or less a clinical perspective but still i would like to relate to them because now in the in near future you will be doing your orthopedic Meniscal tear is something very common, but when it comes, now I'm just creating it. Usually there are two portions of the meniscus, the inner portion and the outer portion. Outer portion comprises around one third of the total surface area, whereas the inner portion usually has around two thirds of its uh, total area. Now, what does this show is that the outer portion is avascular. This is white in color. That's why the term white zone comes. Avascular. Whereas the medial portion accompanies the medial and the lateral geniculate arteries and therefore it is vascular and known as the red zone. As you know that the once and tear happens in the red zone when there's enough blood coming into the particular region their healing prospects are quite high and the mortar morbidity and uh, uh, prognosis is quite good as well morbidity is less hence healing ra rather happens in a very 
quick manner when it comes to lesions in the red zone. Healing is good. But when it comes to avascular region, once a tear happens, the, uh, it takes a little bit of time for the healing to happen. Therefore, the knee has to be um, kept in rest and the supportive treatment has to be proceeded for a longer period of time until the tear is mitigated. So something, uh, something uh, that is not relevant to this question, but again, should know when it comes to orthopedics because of the uh, common nature of these uh, meniscal tears that you see in clinical practice. Uh, another thing that I have to say is that the presence of meniscus will deepen the joint. And because of this deepening, it will have an effect on the congruency of the knee joints, will be more congruent, the motions. And it has the ability to act as shock absorbers, act as a lubricant and also the vascular region of the meniscus are innervated by nerves which provide both sensory as well as proprioceptive functions. Right. Now, something in addition to this I would have to say is about the uh, anterior cruciate ligament uh, injury as well which is very common uh, usually this happen uh, in violent hyperextension of the knee uh, and the uh, posterior ligament could be injured uh, by the dislocation of tibia so again anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments can also be, be torn uh, usually this is uh, seen in some of the sports injuries that you encounter in your clinical practice right so this is what you have to be saying when it comes to this question um, in addition to that i'll be relating about some of the uh, structures that are present in uh, vicinity of the knee joint right so these are the bursas bursa play an important bursas are found related to the uh, tendons. Now they are present in close to the tendons. It's a lot of smooth motions of these tendons and uh, they are named according to their orientation and the location. So few that I would like to illustrate would be the supra patella bursa which is present about to that of the patella and the subcutaneous pre patella bursa, the infra patella bursa there are two infrapatella bursas. There is a subcutaneous one as well as a deep infrapatella bursa. And uh, in uh, close to that of the sub uh, the, sars, the sartorial muscle, there is a subsartorial bursa as well. Then there is a semimembranous bursa. Now, most of the time, due to some of the frictional movements that you encounter, there is a possibility the bursa could be inflamed. The clinical condition is known as bursitis. Some of the common bursitis that you would encounter in uh, the knee joint is the semimembranous bursa, uh, inflammation of semimembranous bursa, which is known as semimembranous bursitis. It's very common and uh, usually you see a swelling in the popliteal fossa and also because of uh, kneeling for a longer period of time, there is a possibility you would see suprapetella bursitis as well. Now, um, so there is also this uh, uh, Baker's cyst. Baker's cyst is not bursitis, but it is uh, it is usually coming, it usually comes secondary to that of osteoarthritis and even rheumatoid arthritis. You would see the accumulation of fluid within the synovium itself which will lead to a popliteal uh, swelling. However, this is quite different to that of the bursitis. It is the synovium that has been swollen, not the bursa. So different but uh, still would, uh, would be having a manifestation which is quite similar to that of uh, semimembranous bursitis. So this is, these are few clinical aspects that I wanted to uh, 
uh, relate to and the uh, and I have said a little bit about the anatomical basis of the knee joint. So in the next video, I will be coming with some of the differential di diagnosis that you would like to entertain when it, when the patient comes to your clinical practice with the complaint of knee joint pain. So until then, goodbye.